Good evening and welcome to the Dark Ozarks. Hello, everybody. Hello, Lisa. Hey, Josh. Hey, everyone. Hope everyone is having a good week. Absolutely. It is uh, an exciting week in the uh, Halloween season of the Ozarks. Yes, it is. And uh, we're we're coming off a uh, oh very very big event. Uh, our haunted Hollister walking tour hosted by Dark Ozarks in Hollister, Missouri was phenomenal. We had so much fun and uh, great, great crowd. We thank all of you who turned out for that 70 plus um, attendees on that tour. And uh, just a fun night. Also a huge shout out to, uh, to Dale Grubaugh and to Joel Telshow, to the Old English Inn and to Turkey Creek Brewing. Yes, uh, we thank everybody, and it was great fun, and uh, look forward to doing it again. Yes, we do, and uh, <clears throat> um, to kick off our mm, calendar of events roster, huge shout out to Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, who is a yes. fantastic sponsor of Dark Ozarks, as well as the sponsor of this Saturday's upcoming event. Yes, Dark Ozarks October Country. Um, um, a big event, a bigger event, um, especially time-wise, uh, runs from noon to eight. Um, of course, people can come and go as they as they wish, and there's dinner breaks, etc. But we're going to be talking about everything in the dark Ozarks, between you know, hauntings and cryptids and uh, lore to dark history, uh, as well as the VFW um, itself which is haunted. Yes, it is. Really excited about that. And, and of course, uh, a lot of personal experiences. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we conducted a very interesting uh, investigation survey in August. And uh, just looking forward to digging further and further into the location. Same then here. Um, on Thursday, October 20th in downtown Joplin, Yes, we'll, we'll be doing the old uh, downtown walking tour, which will cover all of the salacious history of early Joplin and the ghost stories that come out of it. See some of the beautiful um, buildings and, and uh, architecture that uh, is really, you know, outstanding that uh, often we don't think about when we go about our daily lives. Um, and we are doing that in conjunction with the Joplin Downtown Alliance uh, as they put on Third Thursday Art Walk. Uh, always glad to work with them. They support the art, artist community in the area as well as are being instrumental in historic building restorations in the area. Which is so, so important. And <clears throat> many of the events that we have the opportunity to do, the privilege to do, uh, also uh, uh, the, the ticket sales on those go to help in the restoration and preservation of the buildings as well. That's right. And so um, support your local history and have some fun at the same time. And then after that, on, the, on October 29th, we will be in Newtonia, Missouri, at the Ritchie Mansion and the Civil War Cemetery. I am very excited about this event. Uh, we had an incredible time when we were there in April. Mm -hmm. uh, since this is our longest or longer format, I can go a little bit more. Um, I just want to say that now they elicit very strong response. So, you know, uh, but these wonderful Easter peeps that I'm sharing with my Basset Hound puppy uh, actually got in the Walmart and Monette, I think, on the way, on the way to... Uh, <laughs> I, I remember you having the, I remember you having peeps. That's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they are, for the record, they are, even before they got dried out, they're mutant peeps. So you can see that their eyeballs are on the wrong spot. <laughs> <laughs> and I have been saving them for just this occasion. So um, enjoy. Zombie peeps. The zombie peeps. The zombie duck peeps. Uh, say hello. And, uh, uh, apparent so sky is definitely related to me as my basset hound because he loves peeps also <laughs> well i'm not surprised peeps are like moulin rouge people either love them or hate them 
Very true. <laughs> and I'm I'm floating my peep in my cup of uh, coffee that has my keep calm. I'm I'm a deacon. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's the simple things. That said, really looking forward to coming back to the Richie uh, Mansion, and there will also be food at this this time, which I'm very excited about. Yes, same. Um, uh, it's really growing into quite a quite an event, and it does help support um, the maintenance of the mansion and in the grounds there. So, um, it, you know, it's just a fantastic time, and um, get to share history with other people who who do as well so yes and uh, we'll be talking more about the history of that location but there's extraordinary civil war history uh, in association with newtonia yes so where do you want to start uh oh we better not forget um first of all uh beard engine brewing company our yes fantastic sponsor as well Yes, they are in Alba, Missouri, and it is, it's fantastic, fantastic uh, brew and, and food there, too. Mm -hmm. um, they award-winning, in fact. Yes, and then uh, double events on November 19th. Yes, during the afternoon, we will be at Always Buying Books, our other, our, uh, other sponsor tonight that... Um, is kind enough to put up with us and we will be uh, having a book signing for both you and I. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Absolutely excited about that. We thank Bob and Elise so much um, yes. for, for their support. Also invite, them, invite you all uh, to come visit with Bob and Elise who will be setting up with appropriately themed uh, books curated books at <clears throat> uh, Dark Ozarks October Country this Saturday at the Joplin VFW. That's right. And, you know, I'm really excited because, you know, we, 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 we talk about the bookstore on here uh, every week and encourage people to stop by when they're coming through. And I was in there um, was it yesterday, I think yesterday, and um, uh, talking about the events coming up Saturday. And a couple came in uh, that were traveling through on vacation from Kentucky and had stopped at the, uh, the store because they heard about it on Dark Ozarks. So oh, we really goodness. appreciate everybody. So appreciate that. It's very humbling. It's exciting just to build this type of community. And it really is. We, we could not be more thrilled or excited, not just for the Halloween season, but just for the opportunity to be doing this with you all. Exactly. Um, you guys are great. And yes. um, it, it was really nice to see that actually happen in real time. 100%. Of course, we are also uh, available on Branson Podcast Network. Excited about that partnership. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, YouTube. And YouTube. Yeah, if you are accustomed to just watching us here on Facebook or listening to us on Facebook, uh, we have a growing YouTube channel where nearly everything and then some uh, mm -hmm. that we record uh, goes on over there. So do uh, encourage you to uh, to subscribe to the YouTube channel and it's a great archive and you can just put us together as a playlist and binge us for the next 85 hours. <laughs> or not. <laughs> yeah, I... I <laughs> Uh, you guys, you guys, you guys can binge, binge Lisa. I, I would not, I wouldn't binge me. Uh, I have to deal with me on a regular basis as it is. <laughs> well, I wouldn't binge me for the same reason. I have to deal with me. <laughs> um, but fantastic, incredible season. Let's, let's uh, start. Of course, we're, we're dealing with, oh my, I have a puppy that's now high on sugar, peep sugar. Um, couldn't possibly have seen that one coming, but I was hungry. So uh, we were talking about some of our favorite hauntings, but there's a there's a nice overlap on this uh, because mm -hmm. one of my favorite hauntings, possibly one of yours, happens to be Old English Inn in Hollister, Missouri. That's true. 
and of course we were there this weekend and um it, it really is um there there's certain i you know sort of the iconic places that that get reputations uh for people who are interested in um real life haunted locations and uh then there are some, there, there are others that are worthy of that list that just don't have that reputation and yet anyway. And Ye Old English Inn in Hollister, Missouri is one of those places. It is, it is. And I, first of all, now we, we deal with a variety we deal with a variety of, of haunted type locations. And oftentimes, highly haunted area uh, buildings do not necessarily mm -hmm. look haunted. They, uh, uh, and, and, a, and a great case in point is the comparatively modern uh, VFW post in which we will all be uh, accumulating ourselves in on Saturday. And Very true. Much, much of the location is you know, is, is, is in, built during the 1960s, I believe. Uh, certainly from the outside, if you were driving by, you would not look and say, oh my goodness, there is a, uh, you know, mid 19th century Gothic tower just asking to, uh, you know, to be inhabited by ghosts. <laughs> True. But when, first of all, the, uh, the experiences that take place there are real. And yeah. then when you begin digging into the, the reasons uh, and the history, it really begins to contextualize. Now, although the Old English Inn is not as old as it appears, because it appears to be a Tudor hunting lodge, which <laughs> certainly there were, were no uh, uh, English, you know, th three-story Tudor constructions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> late late te late 1400s and through the the 1500s uh taking place in taney county uh, <laughs> <laughs> during during the reigns of uh, of <clears throat> henry the seventh henry the eighth or queen elizabeth the first all sure. that to be said uh the inn is quite old mm -hmm. and it looks like it should be haunted now uh wonderfully it also is yes uh it is a very uh fortunate coincidence that it is uh, <laughs> at least from our perspective uh, right and, and actually um more so than a, a lot of places that tend to get more hype sometimes um yes it which i always is. find ironic <laughs> it definitely is uh you know not currently on the map for paranormal tourism of course if something that dark ozarks you know accomplishes into perpetuity is placing yield english in on the map for paranormal tourism uh, that will make me quite happy same uh, and first of all because i love the inn i, I do too and something that goes together uh, is that, that paranormal tourism goes a long way to helping preserve and highlight um, <coughs> uh, old structures, historic buildings. It does. And that to me is, that's worth it. I always come back to this. If y'all, you know, listening, don't believe in ghosts don't believe in all of these things well first of all what on earth are you doing listening to us but let's <laughs> let's conjecture for a moment uh that you don't believe in these silly things well something that you can believe in is the importance of our history and yes. the importance of preserving historic structures and something that from particularly even even as late as oh, Roaring Twenties and into the Depression, um, so many iconic buildings were created that were, were constructed to last not just a lifetime, 
but meant to last generation after generation. Um, the Gilois Theater comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And the because that place, which also has a number of hauntings associated with it, it is built like a bridge, um, mm -hmm. mainly because Mr. Gilois was a built bridge builder. Uh, so imagine that. But the Old English Inn, uh, the first portion being built and completed and opened in 1912, the second portion uh, being completed and opened in uh, 1927, is also built like a bridge. Uh, this structure is meant to last for generations. It, it really is. Uh, but neglect is, is the unfortunate um, enemy of so many places. And But fortunately, that's not the case there at this point. At uh, this point. But, but, you know, it's, it's always a, a continuing uh, battle against time and, <laughs> and the elements. Um, yeah. And I guess we should say, if we, we weren't clear, this is a place that you can go and stay at. It is a functioning inn, functioning yes. hotel. And yes. so you can go experience <laughs> um, an inn as you would have a hundred years ago. It is, uh, the rooms are beautiful. Uh, they're very beautifully designed. Oh, and something that and depends on, on, I think a lot of this has to do with expectation as well. Uh, many of the, now there's a number of beautiful mm -hmm. suites in the uh, sort of the original lodge, the original 1912 portion. Uh, and then you get into the, the, the more standard rooms mm -hmm. on the second and third floor of the, of the new section which is right. open in 1927. And those rooms are smaller. Uh, and that's, that's where I've stayed uh, when, I, mm -hmm. when I've stayed at the inn. And something that I really, really like uh, about that experience is it is, uh, it, you know, for lack of a better word, it doesn't seem haphazard. You're not wandering through going, wait, what What was, what part of right. an original room was I in? How many walls did they take out to make this room? Which ones did they block in? Um, by 1927, the, from what I can tell, uh, all of the, the new section, new, mm -hmm. uh, had uh, indoor plumbing and, uh, well, of course, it had indoor plumbing, but it had uh, private bathrooms. So, yes. It really is that hmm, only they're like really well done, really well restored. So it is that like stepping back into 1927 in this mm -hmm. space and the the mezzanine, the 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 terrazzo flooring, the on um, not just on the mezzanine and the that grand staircase, but just the whole location is just is quite extraordinary. It really is. It is stunning, and so it's an experience in itself. And then um, it, I think, here we are. Yes. <laughs> there we are. Um, I think that, um, you know, the, the history that lends itself to the hauntings is, is very interesting. Some of it, you know, we can peg down. We 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 know we know, you know, we know how uh, someone died in the barber shop. We know a few things like this, and we know how someone died. Uh, a young man died on the third floor. Um, but some things that we we really don't have explanations for, and that's that's the little girl. Yes, yes, and something that I was thinking, I'll just and throw this out here um some of our actually comparatively private investigative results which are still pending i mean it's mm -hmm. you know open for grabs might be something that we discuss in depth on the subscriber portion we can do that and for for people who don't know uh we uh facebook has offered dark ozarks uh, a subscription option and it essentially works like patreon 
for a small amount per month. You can help us do research. And then you also get all sorts of awesome inside information, which we record on a regular basis. We also get mm, Lisa and myself at our most unvarnished because we, we shoot at very odd hours, oftentimes when we're completely exhausted. So, and sometimes on location as well. So uh, sneak peeks behind the scenes, inside, in investigations, um, at times when we're completely slap happy and who knows what we're going to say. You think we're, we think we're chill mm, on Wednesday <laughs> night, seven o'clock. You should, you should see us, you know, at other times. Yeah, and exactly. quite entertaining. Uh, can be used for, for fun, you know, contextualization later. So we do encourage if that is something that you feel comfortable with, would like to afford, would like to help us do additional research, um, join us for the behind the scenes and in-depth portions. It also, because it is behind that Patreon-like wall, does give us the opportunity to dig into things where it is more conjecture. Uh, a lot of times investigations don't give you clear-cut answers. And right. it would be, you know, you, you do have to approach that responsibly. Exactly. Exactly. So we, we do ask you to join us in that journey and you can look at the top of the page for the subscribe button for information. Yes. And so, and to find out some of the things that we might be thinking about based on our uh, investigation from, I believe, 2019 mm -hmm. think, uh, in uh what is rumored to be one of the most haunted rooms in the end. Um, yes. We'll be recording that, posting that later tonight. So um, what are, what are some of your favorite um, hauntings or stories in associated with the Old English Inn? With the Old English Inn? Well, um, I, I am. I'm always. I'm. I'm always fascinated with, with the uh, the story of the fellow who was shot in the barber shop, mm -hmm. um, and basically left to languish and expire because they had to wait for an ambulance from Springfield. Yes. And there's no highway. Yes, it was. And it was bad weather. It was winter, and. You know, and just the 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 historicity, I suppose, that of that uh, for folks who are familiar with the Branson to Springfield corridor with the four lanes of Highway 65. It um, you know, a normal drive takes you about 45 minutes um, uh, by ambulance. I'm sure you could make it in about 30, and uh, by by life flight, once you're in the helicopter, you could make it in about 10. Um, if that really, you know, so I don't know what the flight time is, but it's not long. No. And during the time of this shooting, they did have a telephone. They call up Springfield and they explain the situation. And the hospital in Springfield says, uh, do the best you can. We'll be there in two days. Mm -hmm. Well, and it was, it was winter and it, there was ice on the ground. And so, um, mm -hmm. and if you, if you think the road's hilly now, that was nothing. Um, I mean, I remember when it was two lane highway and it was much, you know, more of a drive than it is now. And I can't imagine what it was back in the 20s. <laughs> no, I, I cannot either. And it's something that is of particular interest to me as I've begun studying my adoptive hometown's history is that there really was unique strata uh, uh, of people uh, throughout the, the, the history of Hollister. And, and I, I would reasonably say that the history of Hollister begins in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the town was not actually uh, platted. Hush now. The town was not actually platted, incorporated, um, post office founded, and then replatted. <laughs> not necessarily in that order, but between 1904 and 1916, when right. the, the 1916 was the second platting, when uh, William H. Johnson 
and uh, the railroad and the uh, uh, the city council re redirected the town much to much of the town's dismay. But by certainly by the 1890s, you had uh, the mining camps, you had uh, the wagon roads, the wagon trails leading through the region and the immediate region, the, the Turkey Creek River bottom, Turkey Creek bottom. And you had a number of homesteads, of course, the Fortners being the, the original uh, documented homestead, but then additional homesteads as well. And nearly really from the 1890s on you had an an odd um strat you know uh, almost conflicting strata of people mm -hmm. you had your sort of your everyday homesteaders you yeah. had uh certainly in the 1890s a very rough mining crowd mm -hmm. Uh, by the early, by the 19, by 1900, after the mines had largely closed up, you had a, a pretty rough cattleman crowd. That's fair. And uh, rough enough to run off a couple of would-be marshals. <laughs> and, and this is as late as, as 1916 into 1921. Where, where, whereas the cattle wars in Lincoln County, New Mexico, were the early 1880s, you know, that's comparisons. So you're talking, <laughs> you know, 35 years later. Yes. And <laughs> really against, against type. Now, in the, in dropped into the middle of all this, you also had very wealthy tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, very wealthy tourists from, uh, certainly from about 1906 on, and definitely from 1910 on, uh, mm -hmm. Hollister was increasingly renowned for its recreational tourism. Yes, yes. And so it, it's quite a mixture there. It, it is. There's a, this is just kind of going off on a little bit of Hollister history, but there's, there's a great um story two of the city's founding fathers to a degree um were, were really just start out as teenage boys uh and it was uh bill uh johnson william h johnson's son and his best friend pete kite they opened the drugstore in town and could barely make the drugstore go so they would augment their uh their income by by working as as fishing guides mm -hmm. and then they opened a soda fountain so that would help and we're still at times barely making it by now then in 1905 uh wealthy st louis sportsmen slash business owners had opened the main club uh in, up where the ralph foster museum is today or near it and the main club was the disassemblance of uh, the main expo building from the 1904 World's Fair, uh, made of main spruce and built to, uh, to look like an Adirondack Lodge. And they, uh, they brought it down piece by piece. It was the largest um, uh, and first big freight, um, freight by rail into, into Taney County in 1905 and they they took the thing apart brought it by mule and wagon across uh from from the present day location of the branson uh railroad depot across the white river at turkey creek um uh, by uh <laughs> by by mule uh wagon and ferry and then up the hill <laughs> way up the hill uh, yeah. to present day location. What, for folks who are familiar, it's on the, now the campus of College of the Ozarks and reassembled it with parts le enough parts left over to build Mr. Kite a house. Um, and, and, <laughs> but it stood. <laughs> yes. And the, there's a great story in which, of course, the, 
the main club with their their sportsmen from St. Louis would come down and have a wonderful time hunting and fishing and uh, cavorting about. But their many of their wives, who were wealthy St. Louis um, socialites, were bored out of their mind. And uh, Pete and Bill were uh, were trying to figure out how to make ends meet with uh, no one at their uh, at their drugstore. And uh, two uh, rich St. Louis tourists rode up on a side saddle on mules, uh, were excited to find a drugstore with a soda fountain and proceeded to buy pretty much one of everything in terms of ice cream and soda. And <laughs> because there was nothing else for them to do in the wilds of the Ozarks. And uh, apparently Pete and Bill's uh, takeaway on that was uh, the soda fountain idea just might work out. Well, you know, it, it did pretty much. <laughs> it was, um, but, you know, this is, again, I think, of course, Hollister for me has, has just been a wonderful place. It is, of course, the hometown of State of the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, the hometown of State of the Ozarks Fest, our art walks, uh, and just a, a wonderful location for us. It is interesting for me, wrapping my head around its history, something that I'm always in, in the mind of, and this will get back to the hauntings, um, <laughs> that, uh, that is, again, very, very interesting to me, is this, um, mm, Hollister identity. Um, something I would conjecture is that at this point, Hollister has a better sense of its, of its identity today and is undergoing um, a, uh, a cultural uh, resurgence and uh, certainly a, a community and economic resurgence as well, which is very exciting. It's not something you see a lot of in small towns. Very true. And that in the, you know, the turn, the turn of the century, you know, or really not turn of the century, but 1916, uh, we have uh, a considerable amount of conflict. We have a bit of, uh, for example, uh, railroad demands, uh, uh, wealthy post-Edwardian tourism demands, in conflict with uh, the locals, in conflict with the cattlemen, um, a, a town that was being forced to turn toward the railroad and remake itself anachronistically into an old English village when it really didn't want to. Um, it, <laughs> a lot of uh, folks at cross purposes with one another that you know you talk about the good old days and you you assume a uh, a cultural hegemony and that doesn't you know the the history of Hollister doesn't seem to to bear that out yet to a large degree where you know we huh, nobody's always going to all get along all the time but this is a really good place to live right now yeah I and I agree it's it, it, it's pretty well home away from home for me as well. So, you know, um, but as you describe that, that process it went through, when you think about it, you described the synopsis of probably 50, at least 50% of all Westerns. Yes. <laughs> you know, so seeing all of those conflicts that would come to, to, to bear that ended up in your movie. Um, so one hundred percent, all the way down to the marshals getting run out of town and the whole bit. Exactly. So I mean, it's always when when we discuss the issues of the Western mythos, yeah, and how it grew out of the Ozarks. That's a very perfect example of that. 
It really is. And speaking, you know, just of the the history beneath our feet, the history, you know, on on this point, and and in in great irony, uh, there is one of those plaques on the Old English Inn yeah, that says, <laughs> says, you know, on this date and such and such, you know, on this location on this date, such and such, uh, nothing happened. Yeah. And of course, the the um, right next right not even a block down not even oh 50 feet away from that plaque um a an interesting murder which was aforementioned uh took mm -hmm. place in uh, in relationship to a barber shop that is now an an additional seating area of downing street poorhouse yep and uh, if you will uh tell folks that story i'm going to place my puppy in a quiet room for him to calm down I can do that. Um, yeah, it's actually one of my, you know, favorite stories from the end, and it and it very much typifies the the convergence of traditional Ozarks motifs and and what we think of as the Ozarks, or most people do, as well as the Old West, um, and how the, how they are interdependent. Um, Barbershop was um, facing out on the street, big plate glass windows, and there's a fellow that would come by every day, and this fellow's name was Popcorn. They called him Popcorn. And he loved to razz the barber, so give him a hard time. He started spitting on the window, and he'd be spitting with tobacco juice. And so it'd make a mess and the barber would have to wash his window, his front window every day. And he was getting very frustrated. This had gone on for a while. And finally the barber says, it, you know, if you do that again, I'm going to shoot you. And Popcorn thought he was joking and didn't think too much of it. And so the next day he comes by and he spits on the window and the barber wasn't joking. He shot him. Um, so it wasn't initially fatal. So they, they carried him inside and actually sat him in the barber chair, um, while they tried to figure out what to do. There was not a doctor, um, close by. So they, they had to, they had to call ahead to Springfield asking, you know, for an ambulance for them to come get him and take him to the hospital. And, uh, it's also winter and bad weather. There's ice and very poor roads. And so literally they said, you know, we'll get there when we can get there. And it was over two days um, before they arrived. And in that time he had expired um, sitting in the barber chair um, from, from all accounts. And uh, there are times that people will see um, an image of a man in early 1900s work clothes. And we assume that that is probably popcorn. Um, just that whole, that whole image of being shot and carried in and put in the barber's barber chair, just, if that's not, if, if that doesn't uh, sum up so many Western movies, I don't know what does. It really is just such a synopsis. And this is happening something that to me is fascinating about the seminal old west history of the ozarks is that these iconic old west moments were taking place before the west was the west right and they were taking place after well, I mean, if you if you really want to put bookends on it, you know, sort of the the first quote iconic shootout happened on the square in Springfield in July 1865 with Wild Bill Hickok and Davis Tut, yes. um, and the last of the sort of famous infamous Old West games, the uh, Duel and Dalton gang, the Wild Bunch. The last member of that gang was actually killed in a shootout with police in Joplin in 1925. <laughs> so you really, you really have bookends uh, to the Old West that really happened here in those arts. 
You do. And, you know, taking that into account, and I would say 1925 is, is probably about the time that popcorn got shot. It'd be roughly that time period, yeah. I know it was I, I I know it was the mid twenties, but I don't know I don't recall the exact date. But mm -hmm. so so while all of this is going on, you're really having that you know you know that uh, old west uh, cinematic moment of of a shootout and carrying him in, sitting in a chair and see what happens. Um, it's kind of mind boggling. All while all while you have very high end uh, high end tourists there around to uh, to go fishing and hunting. <laughs> yes, and that that um, that contrast and that conflict had to have been interesting to say the least. I, I it had to be to 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 watch it unfold. You know, it really did. What is your favorite haunting in in the building? Oh, my probably the little girl, which we don't really know from whence she's come. We have some conjecture. We'll talk about it on, on the on the subscriber section because it is right. conjecture. But the the first, honestly, the first story that I ever heard uh, about Yule of English Inn which is, uh, let's see, it would have been not long after it had opened post Janet Daly renovation. Right. Which is uh, all, all of this taking place um, in the early 2000s. So we're talking very recent. Um, the, the hotel opened. Uh, there was a mother and son who checked into the hotel. And... <clears throat> You know, they, they go to bed for the night, they, they get up the next morning, and the mother says, I had the strangest dream. I dreamed that there was a little girl standing at the, at the foot of my bed, staring at me, and her son <laughs> turns to her and says, I had the same dream. Yeah. And, you know, th that that just kind of gives you goosebumps and what i like too is that it's still it still happens you know they still get that reported or the sounds of running feet uh up and down the hallway uh and uh, you know uh, the desk clerk will be told in the morning i you know who in the world let their kids run up and down the hall all night um yeah. and sometimes they find out there were no children in the inn or you know whatever um Ironically, just this past weekend, um, a couple that um, uh, were on our tour Friday night, I ran into on the street on Saturdays, and they said that they, they heard the sounds of kids running in the halls that night. And it's unlikely that there were any corporeal children running in the halls, in all fairness. In all fairness, there, 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 not that I'm aware of. <laughs> uh, there was, <clears throat> for me, a really interesting moment. It was comparatively early. Uh, I mean, this we're still talking. Let me look it up. Probably 2017, 2017, mm -hmm. no, 2018. Uh, I photographed the in. I photographed Downing Street at night for the city of Hollister, mm -hmm. and uh, a colleague of mine who's very sensitive, uh, but had never been in the inn. Uh, we had been chatting over at Vintage Paris, and I said, "Hey, you want to you want to go with me? I need to. I was just I needed night photos of downtown." Mm -hmm. So I went down, this is when Vintage Paris was in the, in its old location on Birdcage. And mm -hmm. uh, I just went down and then was just hanging out at Vintage until it was dark enough to go photograph. Right. And uh, while there, she and I started chatting. And then I said, well, I, it's time for me to go take photos. Do you want to, do you want to keep hanging out? And she's like, sure. So we walk up and I have my tripod. I do some night photography downtown for the city. And and then the inn is open. Um, and I said, do you want to go in the inn? She's like, sure. I she said, I've never been in the inn. What can you tell me about its history? 
I said, well, you know, it was built in 1912. I'm just curious to see what you find. Mm -hmm. And so this is somebody who did not know the history of the inn, was not um, familiar with any of the locations. And I think you and I have talked about this, but I'll just go ahead. I think we have, yeah. And share. Uh, went in and I just said, you know, I, I would welcome your impressions mm -hmm. uh, of the location. We go up, and this was also a former student of mine. Mm -hmm. and <clears throat> we go up to the inside, like, okay. We go up the mezzanine, second floor, okay. Um, then we go up to the third floor. And we're, we start walking down the hall on the third floor. And about halfway down, her body language completely changes. She puts her hand on the side of the wall and just walks off from me and walks around the corner. And you know the corner, it's yeah. close to the fire escape. There's nothing back there. Right. Um, probably 30, 40 seconds go by. And then she walks back and looks at me and says, there's a little girl here. <laughs> and I went, yeah. Um, she did not pick up anything on the room that we have a lot of issues with right uh, at that time but the uh the room and it's one of the two it's one of the two middle rooms third floor facing downing street mm -hmm. and she walked up to the door did not i don't think she touched the door she just was in front of it and she said all i see is blood mm. Now, one of my understandings is one of those rooms was associated with a suicide. I, I've heard that, but I, but not in detail or confirmed. Yeah, and of course, as we've noted earlier, uh, hotels over the the decades and generations are not real keen on publicizing the the suicides and the deaths and the ugly deaths that take place within their walls for obvious reasons. Right. And, and people may not, a lot of people may not think about it, but a lot, but over time, a lot of people have checked in to check out so that they don't, so that they're one, their family doesn't find them um, yes. and privacy and. Mm -hmm. And I think, kind of and sometimes even this, the idea that the idea that their family, I'm conjecturing, uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but the idea that perhaps their family won't be the ones to be cleaning up after them, as morbid as that is. I, I think I think that is very, very fair. And actually, one of my all-time favorite ghost stories of the Ozarks has to do with just that in one that I experienced, and that was at the, the now former library building in Joplin, Missouri, which was the site of of the Connor Hotel. Yes. And um, um, it had always been very closed mouthed about suicides, but there was a there was a newspaper uh, interview with the concierge who had worked there for over 50 years and, and upon it, they interviewed upon him upon his retirement because he'd worked there so long and seen so much. And he talked a little bit and said he was aware of at least 10 suicides um mm. and and he happened to be the person of course it was built in 1906 and transom windows over the doors and so forth and he was a, a rather small stature and he would be the one who would if someone didn't uh check out and the door was locked they sent him through the transom windows to find out what happened yes. um and um uh, he talked in uh, the most detail, he said it was the, the one that had affected him the most was a, a lady who had checked in on the eighth floor, uh, a very well-to-do dressed woman. Um, this was in the 1940s, uh, fur coat, et cetera, et cetera. And she had checked in, had ordered a uh, milkshake from room service, drank her milkshake, and jumped out the window. And um, 
so during an investigation, this is when it was still a library and the library had actually called me in. We were conducting an investigation. There were uh, several library staff uh, members there, as well as a couple of other local historians. And um, I asked the question, is the lady who, who uh, ordered a milkshake on the eighth floor here? And literally we're in the main reading room and a wailing is heard, a woman wailing and it, it rises in volume and then just trails off into sobs to the point that everyone in the room turns around and faces it, you know? So, I mean, everybody heard the same thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we want to be really clear. This was not something you heard later on an EVP recording. No, this was real time. This was everyone heard it, stopped and turned around and there were probably 15 people standing there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, incredible. Mm -hmm. So my, my understanding, and again, this is anecdotal, but my understanding is that gentleman checked himself into the old English inn. Uh, of course it was, you know, this was also a hunting and recreation lodge. Right. Went up to that room overlooking Downing Street on the third floor and then proceeded to kill himself with a shotgun. Mm. That's my understanding. Now, when Jess and I were standing in front of the of the of the that room and she goes i don't know what happened here but all i see is blood that was a little interesting to say the least and again this yeah. is somebody who did not know any any history any aspect of the inn and then in context yeah no no context whatsoever and then we're we're standing just pretty much in that location uh a lot of uh, a lot of energy is associated with the attic. Yes. And there, there's two ways into the attic. One is from the caretaker's suite space by, by stair. And the other is the, the, where you put the ladder up and go crawl in. We've, we've peeked yes. in there. And yes, Jess's attention turns to that uh, ceiling entrance. And she's just staring at it. <laughs> and then she looks at me and she says it's watching us and yep. we should probably leave now and I go that works for me and <laughs> we we, uh, we go downstairs and, um, <laughs> and the question is would you leave now no um <laughs> See, yeah. I've had a, alex and i have had a bad influence on you <laughs> it you know there, there is definitely a heaviness associated with the attic yeah a conscious heaviness um now i i was able to stay in the inn within the past 12 months and incredibly quiet incredibly restful night there was no, I, they, the residents did not mind me being there. They left me alone entirely. I enjoyed my time immensely, but if I had been looking for a paranormal experience, I might've walked away disappointed because nothing happened that I was aware of that night, but it was a great night. Yeah. And, and I can say that having stayed there over, over time that I've had a few experiences, um, I do tend to get a better night's sleep when I sleep and when I stay in one of the suites. Mm, interesting. Yes. Yeah. And I've not stayed in the, in the suites yet. I've only stayed in the, in the standard rooms, mm -hmm. uh, which I still really like. And oh, I, I do too. But uh, there, there seems to be, there definitely is more activity in that part of the building. Yes. And this goes, I think largely goes against expectation uh, because that portion of the building is newer, opened in 1927 as opposed to 1912. But yeah. I, there are, hmm, based on the documentation that I currently have in my library, there are gaps in the building's history that appear, in my opinion, to either sit, they just didn't write it down or 
they didn't want to one of the two um and, and i'm not sure which something seems to have gone on a lot in the attic Mm -hmm. and i don't know what or for why what reason but something the attic was clearly used for something that we do not currently have documentation on i you know i have heard you know at least stories that it was related to a speakeasy at one point but who knows it's not it's not like speakeasies were documented so it very true and i i would as time goes by, I would love to do a more full-scale investigation. Same. That. Uh, Stay tuned, everyone. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there was, uh, this is just from Friday night, but uh, uh, a guest on the tour um, had her clothing pulled upon while she was mm -hmm. standing uh, isolated from other people. Mm -hmm. And that was taking place in the parking lot at the south end of the block. Yeah. So, and to me, I think that, you know, we don't, it's, it's in the daytime hours, it's a busy location. It's not, it's an area that I've been through many, many times. I've certainly not, we don't associate it with a specific haunting or a specific incident, but incident, but there are, we don't know everything that took place, obviously. No, we don't. But that's part of the fun and part of the mystery. So it is. And I'm it would be inappropriate for me to tie that experience with this information. Um, but in doing research for the history tour, I did find out that um pretty much the the corner of what was originally Fourth Street and Fourth Street and Front Street, which is now Downing Street and Whitehall Street on the, uh, um, it would be the south east corner uh, of that inter intersection mm -hmm. was uh, the blacksmith shop. And uh, the blacksmith in 1913 was August Dorst. He was from St. Louis, he and his wife, and was apparently very well liked. He shot everyone's horses. Uh, everyone apparently liked August and was quite shocked when someone walked into the blacksmith shop one day in 1913 and shot and killed him mm -hmm. um, in the presence of his wife. His wife was so um, shocked by this that she had a heart attack the same day and died. Uh, oh, their, their double funeral was held in the then three-year-old um, Hollister Depot. Mm -hmm. and apparently was very well attended as everyone knew Mr. and Mrs. Dorst and uh, you know and this is just something I, I've been I've I guarantee you because it's it later became the Ford agency which ultimately became many things then it was furniture store during the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s it's currently Kendall's flea market um, mm -hmm. Kendall's treasures flea market I've been in and out of Kendall's I've helped Chris Boyd set up in front of Kindles in the immediate location where that is this blacksmith shop was marked. I probably stood admiring some sort of, you know, uh, two dollar DVDs or some fine <laughs> china or something in the spot where this man died. Yeah. It is it is a little daunting when you think about it. It is. And that was across the street from where one of our attendees had her clothing pulled upon. Mm -hmm. I and have it may it may be related. It may not. It but it may be. It, yeah, we we just don't know. To me, it's fascinating because it just encourage. No matter how far down the rabbit hole you go, there's always another step. And that's that's the fun with with history. It is. It really is. There's no. No matter how how much you learn, there's always more to be learned. And and even again, I always come back. You know, the paranormal realities to me, par the paranormal side of things is a reality. It's not mm -hmm. something I I question. I I think it's important not to jump at shadows, but I also I don't agree. question the simple reality. Uh, but for those that do, I have no problem with that. And 
into to folks like that, you know, folks who are of that that mindset that um, spiritual realities don't exist for whatever reason. I would say that's fine, but these stories lead us into these people's lives and mm -hmm. into the past in in ways that textbook history rarely does. It give, it it, give, it gives depth and personality, and it it allows this these stories to come alive. And I believe when done properly, when it's not exploitive, uh, to honor these personalities, to honor the past in, in ways that other forms of uh, history recording doesn't necessarily do. I, I agree, I agree. So shifting a bit, yes. what, what is one of your other favorite haunting stories in the region? Oh, in terms of the the you know a place that comes to mind and it's significant to me because it's no longer there uh and that makes me incredibly sad is the riverside inn on the finley river just north of ozark tell the story oh uh, well uh, in the early the turn of the century the 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 riverside inn was begun as a uh a very small uh fried chicken restaurant <laughs> that became its own industry um it was and i'm going to get many of the names wrong so i'm just going to leave that for a later date but uh the the fried chicken cook was an african-american woman um who <clears throat> was known to have the best food uh, mm -hmm. around and the uh the process of supplying chickens and other ingredients became a, something of its own cottage industry for uh, for farmers on the north side of Ozark because it was so popular. <laughs> uh, this was my understanding. Sure, for that lines up. Um, you know the the now iconic and many soon to be demolished um, 1912 Canton Ohio bridges. Mm. The uh, uh, a 1912 Canton Ohio bridge was was put in to cross the river side river cross the finley at the junction juncture point of what would become the riverside inn so it was the river crossing okay. and then it was the place to go for fried chicken and uh howard garrison who was very enigmatic um and eclectic was uh ultimately was the owner of riverside mm -hmm. inn and i Today, there's Riverside Inn Park. Um, the The 1912 bridge has been moved uh, to the Finley River Farms and is under the ownership of Johnny Morris, and which really is just like three miles down river. Mm -hmm. And the and the Riverside Inn has been demolished because it was in the floodplain. Now, in 2010, uh, was that last year? It was on the National Historic Registry. Uh, when they announced that it was going to be demolished, I honestly didn't believe them. I didn't think that they could. I didn't right. think that a, a location so iconic and on the National Historic Registry could. I thought it was a rumor until I saw the bulldozer take out half oh. of the building. And I still mourn its loss. Um, I did photograph the structure extensively in November of 2010. Good. I did have the opportunity to eat there um, once, and it was a glorious five course experience <laughs> that I will never forget. I could even pick out the table that I was sitting at for that particular <laughs> meal and photographs. And it was so, it had fantastic fried chicken. And there are many aspects of its history that I'm that I still need to learn. But as the years went by, more and more pieces were added to the inn to Riverside. Yeah. And it became this sprawling uh, early turn of, you know, uh, pre 1950s, you know, the decades. It, it to me, it, it was mm, uh, memorializing uh, the 1910, the, the 19. 
the teens, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, um, with each new section of construction. The great moment, or great, you know, great bit of history. There was the at one point it had it had in, in rooms to to rent. Uh -huh. to, you could oh, stay thanks. there. Um, it had a lovely greenhouse, and then behind the greenhouse was the speakeasy. And Howard Garrison enjoyed having a speakeasy. At one point, he got carted off to jail because of his speakeasy. <laughs> um, they they put him in jail in Ava. Um, he served his time in the jail in Ava. They let him out. Uh, somebody asked him how it was. He said it was the most relaxing vacation he'd had in years and then proceeded to paint a, a, um, a couple of, make a couple of paintings and hang on the wall. One of them called The View from Ava Jail and the other was The Ava Jail. And he hung both of them in the lobby. <laughs> I, I do like that. I do too. And these, um, Garrison was a, a very unique, eclectic American artist uh -huh. who made a number of paintings. Uh, a number of people around Christian County collected his paintings. Um, and they were oftentimes very odd, very enigmatic, very eclectic in style. The one of my favorites just because it gets stuck in my head and I because I don't know what it's about is a very Spartan 1950s room um, with a, uh, a tall African-American man wearing a white turtleneck sweater uh, three young girls on the other side of the room, Caucasian girls on the other side of the room, and a German shepherd. Sounds like a jute joint to me. <laughs> Not impossible. I'll, I'll send you a picture of it. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's uh, very unique. Now, there, there are a lot, were a lot of hauntings associated with the, uh, with the Riverside Inn. Um, people walking into rooms, seeing someone, turning mm -hmm. the lights on, and they're they're not there. Um, hearing voices. Uh, one one um, uh, story that I've collected from a, from a long time Ozarker, um, and by Ozarker in this case, I mean someone long time in Ozark, Missouri, uh, had gone into the uh, the speakeasy, was taking photos. This was long after the speakeasy was closed. Uh, develop the photos and sees what looks like lighted candelabra in the oh. in the photos. So um, I I was there, you know, for one meal. I was there for the afternoon doing pho photos. I can tell you that there was a mm, a latent tension, uh, like you feel in the air before a thunderstorm. Mm hmm. And that yeah, would just, that feeling would just exist within rooms. There would be points I was doing photos, and I just kind of want to look around behind me. Um, yeah. Not not in a malevolent sense, not in a negative sense, but just in an energetic sense that there were there was a lot associated within those walls. And uh, I do believe that the magnolia tree is still there. When you originally walked up to the front. Uh, door the front door the front entrance was framed by a magnolia tree and uh, the tree I believe is still there nothing else is <laughs> yeah it's always sad when things get get torn down it's I, and, you know, sometimes it's not a choice but I know and I'm I'm not you know I'm not uh, uh, qualified to have an opinion about the uh, the structural integrity of the building and it's it's it flooded regularly. It's, uh, it it always flooded regularly. If the Finley River flooded, the Riverside Inn flooded because um, it was built overlooking the river. And well, over time, that would cause a problem with the building. So <laughs> oh yeah, and I and I get that. Um, at the same time, I just it was such in in. Garrison, I don't 
you know, if, if a location could be haunted by someone putting their soul into the building, the inn would have been it. Uh, Garrison painted massive murals mm -hmm. uh, across walls, across ceilings, uh, over chimney, over, over fireplaces, uh, and then would take it a step further and get stucco and plaster and uh, build three-dimensional art to place, um, you know, <laughs> uh, lamps and candles and things, and then proceed to paint them. My, it, it was very, it was like a 1920s to 1950s avant-garde art explosion. Um, and there would be various rooms. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the later 1960s section was done in a in a Pompeii style uh, yeah. there was there was a winter Russian room done full of Russian style uh, wow. art there was uh, my favorite was the uh, it was a it was a fireplace made entirely out of utilitarian cement blocks <laughs> that had then been whitewashed and then mm -hmm. um, giant life-size sliced watermelons painted the entire height of the fireplace <laughs> uh, th there was a parisian room uh, there was a dutch room uh full of uh of tulips uh, and we're not talking we're not talking just decorative tulip. no we're, we're talking tulips that were about painted the blossoms were this high and then spread across four rooms uh, there, there was a, a, um, sort of a Rhine Valley style, um, banquet room that overlooked the river and the, uh, the interior, um, had a peaked gabled roof with very interesting carved wood all of it whitewashed and then pretty much every square inch of it painted with grapes. Interesting. And then stained glass windows. Of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I walked in, well, and then just the, like the main dining hall, if you remember the, uh, um, the, the, traditional I don't know what it was called but basically those those mm, green and white linoleum tiles that were in every dime store in America yeah that was the floor uh-huh um and then there were columns and most of the columns were faced with mirror glass then okay. um <laughs> Garrison had painted flowers sprawling across the ceiling, spreading out from the uh, uh, the candelabra or the the chandeliers. <laughs> and then when you sat down at the table, it was fine linen and fine silver and fine crystal. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it and the fried chicken was amazing. Just for the record. There you go. <laughs> So, you know, I don't doubt that the location was haunted, certainly by Garrison, quite possibly by a number of other people. It's, it certainly sounds like a, a crime candidate with the amount of energy that would have gotten into all that. Yes, it was not, it was not a, uh, hmm, it was not a disposable building. No. It was not a strip mall. It was, uh, it was not just a space. And I, it was, it was, it was incredible. And now it's the, the riverside, which, you know, Finley River is beautiful year round. So there is that. And we have memories and we have photos. Yes, but, but it's good, also a good illustration of why storytelling is important because you don't get that flavor just from a, even beautiful photos or whatever you know no there's something unique about storytelling there is 
there really is and uh i actually have a lead on some of the recipes so i'm in contemplating it would be neat to uh to recreate that <laughs> on a free weekend <laughs> yeah sometime maybe february i <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so what is your uh, um uh, what is your seance ritual for conjuring probably a five course meal five course meal <laughs> <laughs> let's see if we can conjure how it goes i think you'd appreciate it where the, where the chicken is the focal audience Still bring the chicken to life. <laughs> you, you walked into that one. I know. I know. I really did. And I'm good with that. I'm very good with that. <laughs> it would be, it, it'd be a high end conjuring, let me tell you. Yes, it would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Mm. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but I think, you know, is, is with many of these locations, something that oftentimes does get overlooked is just the, the foods that are associated with each era and, yeah. uh, and the experiences that are tied in with that. And we, we think of, of food being very mundane. We don't think of it as being magical, but I think that in many ways it is and in many ways, it is the, mm, you know, food and writing are, are two of the most accessible forms of magic that we have. Very true. Uh, very true. Um, although I think both take a lot of, can take a lot of uh, consternation and talent um, to be pulled off <laughs> well. To be done well. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> interesting mm, conceptualization, but something that we, over the course of this podcast and, and video cast, as we continue to do research, something that has become apparent, certainly from our perspective, is that pop culture uh, takes our, our culture and our mm -hmm. heritage reconstitutes it sometimes well sometimes very badly mm -hmm. and then sells it back to us for a profit yes um and even when it's done well it's still usually a, a fairly watered down process and i would say the same happens with food with our cuisine our regional it can anyway yes it, it can and then we find little um uh find a place that encapsulates that magic yes and yes. um which is a, a, a completely different project that we have, that we have. <laughs> <laughs> which uh, you know is uh mm, on the horizon as well but it involves mm -hmm. eating so i'm very much for it uh, another <clears throat> location, uh, just as a whole, that, that I find fascinating and exciting, uh, particularly from a paranormal standpoint, is Eureka Springs, despite, mm -hmm. and I shouldn't say despite, uh, Eureka Springs has done a fantastic job of utilization of uh, paranormal tourism. The springs themselves. Oh, now you're back. We're back. Yep. Yeah. Um, I was wondering. So go ahead. <laughs> Eureka has done a Eureka Springs, Arkansas has done a fantastic job of capitalizing upon paranormal tourism, and mm -hmm. and my hats off to them for that because of course it is definitely facilitating uh, the preservation of so many of these structures and. That said, um, you know, I, just some of the dynamic that can take place 
once you you build a a paranormal tourism reputation Mm -hmm. everyone it seems who goes to the location for paranormal tourism wants to have an experience that i mean that 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 is true um and that can build expectations that can be hard to to live up to on a day-to-day basis even in a very active location yes and another i think an interesting psychological dynamic uh, you all who are listening can you know throw something at me later in real life uh, you'll have a great opportunity on saturday and uh because <clears throat> i'll be there um <laughs> but <laughs> um you know if you if you hype yourself up for an experience enough yeah let's be let's be very candid you can imagine that you've had an experience when in reality it you haven't that's true or vice versa have such expectations that a otherwise impressive experience seems to be a letdown i mean it can go either way yes and you know, I, I will talk about the, well, the basin and the crescent, a couple of, you know, a couple of situations. Uh, just briefly, one of my two most personally terrifying experiences uh, with the paranormal, one of them happened in Des Moines, Iowa in 1998, and one of them happened on the fourth floor of the crescent in 2008. Mm-hmm. Uh, in both cases, for me personally, at that moment, both of them were unbelievable, were, were terrifying, and I didn't even see right. anything. I was within the presence of something that did not like me, right. and it did not like me a lot. And I was aware enough to know that. Mm-hmm. Um, in the in the case of the my <laughs> my, my personal haunting, um, in. Uh, uh, on the fourth floor of the Crescent, it occurred in the middle of the afternoon. I was surrounded by people who were not being affected right. as I was. And I think that is a, an interesting circumstance. But it's something, it's something really to, to know that and when you do investigate over time, you figure that out, that uh, activity can be selective as to who observes it. Yes. And that is a fascinating dynamic. It's certainly mm-hmm. a dynamic to take into consideration. And I think it's also a dynamic that causes a lot of people to um, dismiss evidence. Well, yes, uh, particularly other people's experiences, because if they experience that, everyone else in the room must have. Yes. But to me, often, I think when those kind of situations happen, I think it tends to be almost more likely to be intelligent or interactive uh, because if, it's, if it is just residual and um, footsteps or something like that, that usually more people in the room or everyone hears it um you know um the example i gave earlier of of the woman shrieking uh Mm -hmm. that would have been the connor um you could say it was residual because everyone heard it although the timing with the question was so immediate that it made you wonder that some that it wasn't a reaction to what what we were doing um so but when you have something that really affects one person profoundly and no one else in my experience it comes down to usually one of two things a very intense real experience or someone that is trying to create a hoax for some reason and you usually can parse that out with the other what else is going on with them right i and and 
you know, again, what I think was particularly interesting for me was that this experience that I had at the Crescent, uh, I did not know it was haunted at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, The only information that I had was it is a beautiful hotel and you should go visit it. Well, and, and for context, for people who are used to hearing about the Crescent incessantly on paranormal reality shows and the internet, uh, this would have been fairly early in that process. It was not sort of the, you know, household word that it is now in the paranormal field. Right. And <clears throat> I, uh, you know, for people who are interested, I was standing on the Sky Bar uh, balcony on the fourth floor. It was April 2008. It was a beautiful, sunny uh, afternoon. There was easily a dozen other people on the balcony with me. And as I'm standing there admiring the view, and the last thing in the world that I would be thinking about at this point is the paranormal, I mm-hmm. get the sense that someone is standing directly over my left shoulder. And that someone really does not want me to be there, Uh, intensely does not want me to be there, Uh, intensely enough and is able to communicate that to me without words so intensely that I leave rapidly Mm -hmm. and uh, in such a heightened sense of fight or flight that I am afraid to get in the elevator because I'm afraid that whoever he is is going to come in there with me and I'm not going to do that because I'm into the elevator and I couldn't get away. So I take the stairs instead. And uh, by the time I get down to the main lobby, don't feel that. And so shaken that I leave. I have since been back to the Crescent many, many times over, over since 2008. So I, I've lost count. I, I go regularly. Mm-hmm. Um, have never had that experience again. There you go. Yeah. The, the paranormal is not something that you can just turn on and off at your whim. No, it, and it's, yeah, it's not a command performance. And I think that is something that as that some people can get an expectation of for paranormal tourism, that mm-hmm. there must be guaranteed results. Well, and I think that is a, it's something that is, I'll just be very blunt. I think it's something that is wrong with American culture right at the moment. Is that we, instant gratification yes we 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 think that we deserve to have on-demand experiences and mm-hmm. you, you know that that and, and it, it really leads to a a deadened sense of the world around us because it's the idea that if something can only be experienced once you know that we don't know what to do with that. And we're back. You might start with if, if something can only be experienced once. Yes, if, if something can only be experienced once, we really don't know what to do with that. We're, we're like, Okay, you know, this, this is something I've contemplated often. Um, experiences that are, here's, here's my line of thought on this. Experiences that are unique. Um, as amazing as the experience is, we find it unsettling. Mm-hmm. Because you can't just have a do-over. Right. And, 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 and in part, in this context, the reality shows have, have leaned into that by saying, you know, oh, we're documenting this, you know, and it's provable or, or, or getting towards provable, you know, that yeah. you can't always do that. I think the, the expectation issue, the, the perfect analogy is television. We have an on-demand uh, experience at this point, you know, streaming services and well, and even before that, cable, etc., where you have multitudes of choices mm-hmm. 24 hours a day. Yes. And where a lot of shows are 
are shown over and over. So it really didn't matter if you caught whatever show when it premiered on Tuesday night at 8 8 p.m. because they're going to replay it again later that night or it's going to be on tomorrow night. And so nothing has the experience of the moment the way that I get one shot at seeing it and if I don't, I never get to see it or it may be years. Yes. And that does something to the psyche, I think. Yeah, it does. Uh, first of all, it makes us weirdly self-entitled. Yes, yes, um, it, it really does. And and the other that I think is more damaging <clears throat> is it teases the mind into the belief of our own immortality. Because if nothing, if we can constantly repeat everything, it fools the mind into believing that everything can just continue as is indefinitely and there's no sense of loss. I, 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 agree, with, I agree with you there. I, I think you see a lot of that going on and then it becomes, well, basically you should be able to snap your fingers and um, you know, this experience that you, you're here for is going to happen on cue. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's the the scene from Beetlejuice comes to mind where they say, you know, we're, we're you know, you can't, you know, it just doesn't happen on command. Or I forget how it goes, but you know, they talk <laughs> about that. You know, they, you know, they aren't just performers. You know, and uh, we've gotten to a point where we kind of expect that in so much of life. Period. That when when people don't get it, there is a odd reaction. It is. And uh, the, the point that I really began thinking about it was actually watching an interview with Brandon Lee that he that was shot for The Crow. Uh-huh. And it's very incredibly well spoken in this interview. And he's talking about that how and ironically um, and that of course he died in the production of in the making of mm-hmm. The Crow. Uh, but he was talking about how uh, the story had really made him aware of contemplating his own mortality and Mm -hmm. that that this you know and he said you know i'll paraphrase it because he said it quite beautifully and i won't do it justice but the paraphrase is uh, you look at a beautiful full moon and you could easily take it for granted because you've seen beautiful full moons every month but Mm -hmm. then in the back of your mind, as you begin to contemplate your mortality, you realize everything has a number, everything has a limit. How many more of these will I see? Is it a hundred? Is it five? Is it 50? There are limits to every experience and we are finite beings within this corporeal world. And yeah. hearing him say this, and literally it was either weeks or days before his accidental death, uh, really struck home to me how powerful uh, individual experiences are. They, they are. And um, at the same time that we proliferate media and entertainment, um, we pretend that they have less value. Yes. And, and, and that's a trick of the mind. And I think that the contemplations of, of, uh, you know, uh, the finiteness of our corporeal selves. I think that the, uh, the infinite qualities uh, of what is beyond are a- incredibly important. I think that it, it, when done correctly, can lead us to a point of humility, um, to a point of wonder, uh, mm-hmm. to a point of deep gratitude. And those are those are aspects of quote unquote the paranormal that I find very encouraging. I, I, I do too. I, I kind of look at it that I you know I'm fortunate enough I have I've done this enough that you know there are places that I've investigated even hundreds of times that um, the same type of thing would, has happened innumerable times in that location 
and it's satisfying to the extent of I can be more assured that it's happening because I've experienced it a hundred times. Mm -hmm. But when you also look at the, the experiences that make the biggest impression are the ones that are never repeated. Yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I will say that my, my experience that one time on the fourth floor, um, I, I'm, I'm okay with not repeating that. I, <laughs> <laughs> you know um and you know my, my only other experience was like i said in des moines on a, mm -hmm. in a in a in a in a location that has nothing absolutely nothing to do with paranormal tourism yeah well and that's the thing is that activity happens in a lot of places that quote aren't on the map and that's one of the beauties of it yes yes it is Oh, that said, that might be a good place to uh, to conclude for this evening. I think so. We appreciate everybody and uh, hope to see you at some of the events coming up. Go to paranormalsciencelab.com um, for information. Go check out the sponsors, Always Buying Boats in Joplin and Beard Engine Brewing Company in Alba. And yes. we'll be back next week. Absolutely. Check out our subscriber stuff. We're going to be putting crazy things on there. Yep. <laughs> and thanks josh thanks alex oh, thank you lisa thank you alex <laughs>